Howdy, tea people. I'm Sohan. We're here at the beautiful Guanyin Tea House in Austin, Texas. Welcome to another episode of Gong Fu Tea Cha. And today we are going to talk about one of my favorite types of tea, the Wu Yi Oolongs. Oh boy, I love Wu Yi Oolongs. So, what are Wu Yi Oolongs? Oolongs, let's start with that. Well, it's actually Wulong, which means dark dragon. And I'm going to go ahead and show y'all what this dark dragon tea looks like. This is why they call it dark dragon, because you have this nice, twisty leaf. And what is it? It is partially oxidized tea. That's what Wulong tea is. And remember, we've talked about green tea, Lu Cha, or green tea, and how it's completely unoxidized on this unoxidized level of the spectrum. And then we've talked about Hong Cha, or red tea, aka black tea, which is fully oxidized. Well, Oolongs are partially oxidized. They fall somewhere in the middle of there. And what are Wuyi Oolongs? Well, the Wuyi Mountains are located in northern Fujian in southeast China, which is where Oolongs in general come from. They're all from that southeast Chinese region. You've got Fujian, you've got Guangdong, you've got the island nation of Taiwan as well produces Oolongs. And so those are the places you get Oolongs. And so in the north of Fujian are the Wuyi Mountains. They're very beautiful and they're the home of these teas right here. So that's going to give us a look at our Wu Yu Longs. As you see, they are long, twisted, curly leaves that are dark and oxidized. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started drinking some of this delicious tea. So the Wu Yu Mountains are famous not only for being the origin point of oolong teas, and this is always a point of contention in China, who invented what, but the strongest claim definitely goes to the Wuyi Mountains, which the claim being that they were invented there. These partially oxidized roasted teas were invented in the Wuyi Mountains in the end of the Ming Dynasty, the late 15th century. And these are supported by records, poems actually, from the beginning of the Qing Dynasty in the 16th century that refer to oolong tea, partially oxidized oolong tea, and make specific mention of the Wuyi Mountains as their origin point. So very strong, credible claim, something that we don't get that much with tea stuff, so we're grateful for it. There we go. So in addition to being the origin point of the technique of making oolong teas, the Wuyi Mountains are known for imparting a very distinctive di wei, or terroir, flavor of the earth, to the teas that are grown there. And to understand what that flavor is, we have to look at the geography of the Wuyi Mountains. They are sparse. They are uh, craggy, rocky mountains that don't have a lot of soil. And so the plants that grow there, including the tea plants, are very slow growing and they're dwarfed. Even some of the very uh, ancient Wuyi Oolong plants, which there's some that you know, go back centuries, even these centuries old plants are pretty small compared to the giant tea trees of Yunnan, for example. There we go. There we go. I'm just gonna let us look at this beautiful color here. See this beautiful red color? That's that oxidation. Not quite as red as the Hong Chas that we did in the last episode, but nice and rosy red. And that is that oxidation level right there. So, because these plants grow slowly and are dwarfed, they end up concentrating a lot of nutrients in their leaves. And this gives them a very distinctive and very complex mineral flavor that's called the yen wei, or the rock taste. And the, the wuyi oolongs are collectively known as yen cha, or rock teas for that reason, which is, I think that's such a great name. And what is the, that's this, this yen wei, this rock taste? Well, it's a very broad, profound, complex flavor that is very nuanced. It's caramely, it's roasty, it's toasty, it's woody, it's tobacco-y. Um, it has a very particular mouth feel. Um, uh, you can feel it in your throat. It gives a nice cooling sensation in the throat. And because of this really big flavor that is common to all the Wu Yu Oolongs, to all the Yen Cha, you do end up having more, a little bit more clumping profile-wise, where the Wu Yu Oolongs are not as distinct from each other as, say, the different Phoenix Oolong varieties are from each other. Those are really, really distinct with all kinds of different characters. The Wu Yu Oolongs tend to you know, be a little bit more similar to each other, but because of that deep complexity and profundity, 
any given Wu Yu Oolong, a good Wu Yu Oolong, is among the most complex and nuanced teas around in the terms of the abundance and variety of flavors and fragrances you get from them. And in fact, uh, Wu, one of the most famous Wu Yu Oolongs, Da Hong Pao, or Big Red Robe, is probably the most expensive tea in the world. It has been the most expensive tea in the world, and it may still be the most. It always changes. Something else will come up and get a higher price. But Da Hong Pao, Big Red Robe, is definitely one of the most famous and expensive and highly sought after teas in the world, uh, especially among Chinese teas. And it's the first of the four famous bushes of the Wuyi Mountains. The Wuyi Mountains make dozens of different varieties of tea. There are different, dozens of different varieties of tea, uh, oolong tea plants that are grown there. But the four big famous ones, the Chinese like to make lists of things, and so they have the four big famous bushes, the Si Da Ming Cong, and Da Hong Pao, Big Red Robe, is the first of these. Then you also have Shui Jing Gui, which means golden tortoise, golden water turtle. Um, and then you have Tia Lohan, which is iron arhat. An arhat is one of the disciples of Buddha who achieved nirvana. Uh, and then you have Bai Ji Guan, which means white coxcomb, and that's what we're drinking today. And white coxcomb has uh, an, a fun origin story. Da Hong Pao, Big Red Robe, has a fun origin Actually, they all have fun origin stories. Da Hong Pao, the Big Red Robe origin story is very famous. You can find it anywhere on the internet, so go check that out. A lot of other people have probably told it a lot better than I could. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell the white coxcomb story because it is a fun story also. And I'm just going to take a sip of this first and talk about its flavor real quick. So what is white coxcomb? One of the famous Wu Yulongs. It's got this incredible custardy, egg yolky profile that's uh, it's not really a better way to describe it. It's very sweet. It's very, um, got a lot of subtleties that are kind of tucked under this big rolling yen wei, this big rolling mineral flavor. And it does have this distinctively um, custardy, egg yolky, um, a little bit of like a downy soft character to it. Mm, nice. So the story of White Coxcomb goes that one day a monk observed a heroic rooster defending his chick from a hawk, and he was killed defending his chick from this hawk. And the monk was so moved by his bravery that he buried the rooster. And where he buried the rooster a year later, uh, the following spring, a tea plant sprung up, and that was the first White Coxcomb tea plant. And in addition to that, and we'll look at the leaves at the end, in addition to that, the leaves of the White Coxcomb plant actually are light in color, and they also have a bit of, I'm gonna put this one here. They have a bit of um, uh, serrated look to them. All tea leaves are serrated, but these have like big floppy serrations that make it look like the comb of a rooster. So that's where, and another way it gets its name is from the appearance of the leaves themselves, and it does have this cute story. So how are uh, Wu Yulongs processed? This is very important because we've talked about the flavor of the earth where they come from, and we've talked about the, the genetics, the different varieties, including these four famous varieties, and how those give rise to the different characteristics. But it's also very important to think about the way they're made. Oolongs are very, very complex and probably require the most skill, knowledge, and effort of any single category of tea to process correctly not the least of which because uh, there are all these different varieties and they do have these varieties specific, uh, specifically separated from each other, like white coxcomb and, and big red robe. If this was a different tea growing region, those different varieties might just be processed together and just be, this is the tea of the region. But when we make oolongs, especially Wu Yi and Phoenix oolongs, we're very particular about separating out all the different breeds, all the different sub-varieties. And so a Wu Yu Oolong tea master has to be skilled in oxidizing each given tea to the appropriate degree, because if you oxidize it too little or too much, then the distinctive characteristics won't be fully brought out. And this is accomplished by twisting and rolling and withering, all these different ways of distressing the leaves and letting them sit in order to oxidize, distressing them to release that enzyme polyphenol oxidase to catalyze that oxidation of the tea and then letting them sit and just chill and go through that oxidation process. And you want to oxidize them to just the right degree. Wu Yulongs in particular are generally medium to fairly heavily oxidized, more so than say the Phoenix and the Anxi Oolongs and the Taiwanese Oolongs. You can have low oxidation versions of all those. The Wu Yulongs are always fairly heavily oxidized. 
Um, and then there's a charcoal roasting process to dry the tea out, and this is the tanbei process, and this is super, super important. The better part of the skill of a wuyi oolong or any oolong tea master is going to be this hand roasting step using uh, white hot charcoal and tossing the leaves in a basket above it, and that's called tanbei. And a good tanbei can make uh, a tea fantastic, a bad tanbei can destroy the flavor of a tea, and if you are not good at this tanbei process, you end up over roasting your teas and they all taste the same. They all end up tasting like uh, toasted marshmallows, kind of, uh, or like coffee. You know, they get this really, really heavy roasty taste and some people are really into that. But a well roasted oolong is nuanced and subtle. It's not just a whole party of charcoalness altogether. So, um, and then you, you may not have noticed that when we made this tea, I didn't pour out the first steeping like we usually do. I didn't rinse this tea. I set it aside here. And that wasn't just for the benefit of showing you guys that lovely color. That's because it has become the custom in recent years with uh, wu yu oolongs among certain people, not everyone does this, but I like doing it, to not throw away the first steeping, but save the first steeping and drink it at the end after you've gone through all of the permutations of the tea and enjoy the cold, it's will have cooled by that point, the cold first steeping as a way of taking you back to the original flavor of the tea. It's called the Hui Wei Bei, which means returning flavor cup. So Hui Wei Bei literally means returning to the original flavor of the tea. And because it's cold, it allows us to taste some dimensions of this incredibly complex and nuanced flavor profile that we wouldn't get otherwise. And it's great, you know, uh, wuyi oolongs, they taste great right from the start, so no reason to waste good tea. I know that sounds a little bit uh, iconoclastic, but I didn't make it up, it's from China. So I'm gonna go ahead and taste, oh, that's not it. I'm gonna taste some of this cooled Hui Wei Bei. It hasn't had much time to cool because we're not actually drinking tea, I'm doing Gongfu Tea Cha, so not super cold, but it is still the first steeping, and it is gonna have a different profile than uh, these other steepings that we've just gone through. And so I'm just gonna, it's cooled a little bit, yeah. Okay, yeah, it has cooled a little bit, and um, what comes out when it cools, some of the biscuity notes, some of these like chewy, sweet, dense, moist biscuity notes that you can get from some of these teas, which are really nice, and almost a little bit of like spiciness comes out uh, when you let it cool like that, and also you are going back to the first steeping of the tea. And then as promised, I'm gonna go ahead and let us look at the leaves here. They're not done yet because I've only steeped this tea three times, but I'm gonna go ahead and pull, ooh, here's a good one. Go ahead and pull one out and let y'all look at it because as I was saying, these leaves are fairly light in color compared with some other Wu Yi Oolong leaves, which again are so heavily oxidized in general. And that is what gives them their name, white coxcomb. They're obviously not white. And then you have these nice, serrations. I've almost got this, I swear to God. These nice floppy serrations. It's folded literally exactly in half. Can you see that there? Right against my thumb, those serrations and the light color of the leaf give this name, give this tea its name, White Coxcomb by Ji Guan. It is one of the four Sida Ming Song, the four big famous bushes of the Wuyi Mountains, home of oolong teas, and the subject of this episode of Gong Fu Tea Cha. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Please stay tuned for more great episodes. We're gonna cover all the other oolongs and you can find out all about them too. They're great. And if you enjoyed this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Tea House Ghost, and we will keep bringing you all these great tea episodes. Thank you very much.